What's up ladies and gentlemen, it's Ryan here and today I want to talk about crypto and the blockchain from a developer standpoint. Now I've always been super skeptical about crypto because there's people who pretend to be super smart about it, they hype it up and hype it up and hype it up. And then they do the whole pump and dump and they essentially scam a bunch of people out of their money. Aside from that, I didn't see a whole bunch of utility in using these cryptocurrencies. Yes, it's cool. The idea of being able to digitally transfer money to someone instantaneously without a centralized authority and all that mumbo jumbo. But let's be honest, most people who trade cryptocurrencies are only doing it with the hope that it's going to appreciate in value and then they can cash out. And most online markets or markets in general don't even accept crypto as a valid form of currency. So to be honest, from a day to day standpoint, there's not a whole lot of reason to use it. But as a developer, there are some really cool things that you can do with the blockchain. So if you want to understand what the Ethereum blockchain looks like, the best place to go is this website. So this is etherscan.io and this will tell you pretty much everything about the Ethereum blockchain. It has the Ether price, uh, the number of transactions, which is currently 1.3 billion, the gas price, which I'll explain in a little bit. And we have the whole list of transactions that have ever happened on the blockchain. So when we view these transactions, we could see what type of transaction it was. Sometimes it's a transfer. Sometimes it's executing some function. Here we can see it's a withdrawal. There's actually a lot of different things you can do on the blockchain other than simply transferring money between two individuals. So here's a transfer here for 0.3 Ether from one address to another address. Let's check this one out. So we can see it happened about a minute ago. It was for 0.3 Ether, which is about a thousand bucks. We can see that there was a transaction fee of about eight bucks. So this concept of a gas price might seem kind of funny at first, but it actually makes sense. So this whole blockchain is distributed, right? Meaning it exists on thousands of different computers. The people who own those computers, we call them miners. So in order for those miners to keep their computer running 24 seven and using up all that electricity and bandwidth, well, we got to pay them. And so that's what this gas price is. So you may have recently heard about NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and websites like this, OpenSea.io and SuperRare.com, they allow you to buy and trade NFTs. An NFT is really just a transaction inside of the blockchain that says that this particular user owns this particular thing. So here on OpenSea.io, we can see all these different NFTs that are posted and you can see the price for it. This person wants 10 Ether for this it's just pretty much a JPEG image. So this is pretty much a website where you can buy a JPEG for thousands of dollars and then you can sell it again for thousands of more dollars, except it's not really dollars. It's ether that eventually gets turned into dollars. So here's another website called super rare and it's the same deal. It's an online digital marketplace where art is traded for Ethereum. So I can go down and see the history for it. And you'll see that there's something that says view TX. That's the transaction. This will actually open up EtherScan and show me that transaction inside the blockchain. And this is how you know if a transaction actually took place or if they just stole your money. So we can see that for this particular transaction, it's called a mint. Minting is when you create a new NFT. We can see the token ID, which is the unique ID for that particular NFT. And you can see that there was a transaction fee here for about 80 bucks. So once again, that's where that gas fee comes in. Now what's really cool about this website, etherscan.io, is that we can dig deeper. So here I can see every token that's ever been created by this contract. And if I click down here, I can see the actual source code for that contract. So here we can see the actual source code for the super rare V2 NFT token. So if you wanted to create your own NFT, that's a straight up duplicate of super rare. You could do that pretty easily actually if you know how to like deploy it and all that jazz okay so we saw what the blockchain looked like and all the transactions and the accounts and the contracts that's cool but that doesn't really get to the nitty-gritty of what this is all about so now let's take a step back for a second and take a look at this digital art piece on super rare so this is an nft and it shows you the transaction history down here let's go ahead and open this up and it shows us the transaction on etherscan and here we can see that this is a transaction from a user account to a contract 
for the amount of 0.5 ether, which is $2,000. Now, if I take a look at the person, okay, so they have 17,000 bucks in their account, 4.7 ether, and I can see all of the different trades that they've done. However, if I go back and I click on the contract, so here I can see that the contract has a balance of 13 ether. Now this is a contract. This is a piece of code that was deployed to the Ethereum blockchain. This is not a human being. <laughs> so this is to me where it started to click. The idea that a contract, which is code, can have a balance. In other words, it can hold money and it's bound to the constraints of its code. So you might say that the owner of that contract has ultimate control over that contract. Well, maybe if the contract was written in that way, but contracts can be written in very strict ways. You can technically write a contract that takes money and never gives it to anybody. And that's a contract. So this is the point at which I start to see the power of the Ethereum blockchain, the ability to create a program that can hold a balance and under certain conditions, it can transfer those funds to certain individuals. This is why they're called smart contracts. So I needed to make sure that this wasn't just a bunch of hocus pocus. So I started developing a smart contract locally and a D app or decentralized app as they call it. So the front end uses React.js and the back end is pretty much just the blockchain. There is no API or anything. So what this is, is a to do list powered by the blockchain. So I can say, do the dishes, take out the trash, do homework. And then I could also mark these as done. So on the outside, this looks like a normal app that would just have a database for a backend, but there is no backend API for this. The backend is the blockchain itself that's running on my local machine. And to prove this, we can look at the transactions here. For this last transaction, we can see from 0617, that's my account address here. And then recipient is 0x09f, that's the contract address. So you remember on etherscan.io how a user could send a transaction to a contract? Well, that's exactly what I'm doing here. So there's this library called Web3 that allows your front end to talk directly to the blockchain. But now let's take a look at the actual smart contract because that's where the actual core logic is. So this here is the smart contract. This is written in a language called Solidity. And it looks very similar to Java or any object oriented programming language that you've ever worked with. Uh, the data types are pretty similar. You have an unsigned int, you have strings and functions and all that lovely stuff. So basically this is doing all the stuff you would think a programming language would do. When it comes to adding a task, all we do is set the value in the map to a new task struct. To set the task as done, we just get that value from the map and set it to done. Now there is a little bit of funkiness of how maps work in Solidity. For example, you cannot check if a value exists in a straightforward way. That's a topic for later. So then we have this function get tasks. So first of all, the Ethereum virtual machine was not meant to handle logic like this. It can technically do it, but if you were to actually do this, it would be very expensive in gas fees to the point that it would just be kind of impractical. So once you've finished writing a contract, then you have to compile it. So there's a tab here. You can click compile, and this is going to compile this into bytecode. Bytecode is what's going to eventually be deployed to the Ethereum virtual machine. Then we click here, the deployment tab. We can choose where, which environment we want to deploy to. I'm choosing web three provider, which is actually my local, um, Ethereum node. Um, we can choose a gas limit, which is basically what's the maximum amount of gas we're willing to spend to push this transaction through. But since this is a local machine, you have infinite money. So it's pretty much doesn't matter as much, but it is great for testing because once you do deploy it to the real network, then it is going to cost real money, right? And then we can click here to deploy that. By the way, this editor is called Remix. It's an Ethereum code editor. It's built specifically to write smart contracts in Solidity, uh, to compile them to bytecode and then deploy them. It has a lot of neat features for optimizations. Like here, it's giving us tips on how to reduce gas costs. 
Like it's saying that we should avoid using loops, for example, because that's going to be more processing, more storage and all that. So, so show me the money. Okay, so the idea of deploying code to the blockchain and having this decentralized thing is pretty cool, but there is a currency aspect to it as well that's pretty tightly coupled to this whole thing. So anytime we perform an operation here, let's say I add an item to the to-do list, pay attention to this account balance on the left. You can see that it's constantly going down. So basically, I'm losing Ether every time I perform a transaction against the blockchain because somewhere out there in the world, there's a computer where that transaction was processed. And that transaction takes computational power, which takes electricity, which means that person who owns the computer and keeps it running should get paid. And that's really what keeps this whole thing going. So you'll notice that down here, it says estimated gas. So you can actually make a query to the blockchain and ask the blockchain, how much does it cost to perform this specific operation? And it's going to give you back a number. And then from there, you can make your request and say, OK, I'm willing to pay that amount. And then that amount of Ether is going to be deducted from your balance. But if you don't have that amount in your account balance, then you're you can't make that request to begin with. OK, so I just updated the UI a little bit to reveal some more information. So earlier, you remember how I said that a contract can have a balance, right? A piece of code, not a human, but just code in the blockchain can actually own a balance of Ether, a.k.a. money, right? So I was able to replicate that situation locally. So here I have a button send ETH to contract. So when I click that, it sends 100 Ether to the contract. And now the contract has a balance of 100. Every time I click this, it's going to increase the contract balance by 100, but then it's going to decrease my account balance by that same amount. And since I'm the one who initiated that transaction, there is a gas fee associated with it. So if I take a look at the result here of this last transaction, OK, block hash, block number, blah, blah, blah. And I can see the amount of gas used. So here we can see this was the amount of gas used for that transaction. That means that from my account, it deducted the 100 that I sent and it deducted 21,228 because that was the cost for the gas to make that transaction go through. So, yeah, there definitely is a shady side to crypto. There's always going to be the crypto guru who promise you quick riches. And anytime there is the promise of quick money, it, bad things are going to happen. But from a developer standpoint, looking at the potential of what kind of applications we can build on the blockchain, it's actually pretty phenomenal. I mean, imagine if the history of mankind was written in the blockchain. We have that saying, don't rewrite history. Don't retell history differently than how it actually happened. And that blockchain is copied thousands and thousands of times across computers across the world. So blockchain allows us to have a zero trust society where we don't need PayPal or Venmo or the bank or some escrow agency to manage our money for us. We can actually do it directly on the blockchain and we can trust that this piece of code is going to do exactly what it says it's going to do. And that's about as fair as it gets. Now, that also means that there's no safety net. So if you lose access to your account, you're screwed. There is no forgot password setting. You can't just show your ID card and get access to your thing because it's in the blockchain and it's encrypted. And that's the highest level of protection that you can have, really. So if you like the topic of crypto and you want me to dig deeper into it and talk about it more, then let me know in the comments below. And hey, if you like the video, please like and subscribe and support a little YouTuber like myself. Thank you for watching.